Okay, tonight is uh, 3rd Nephi, chapter 7. Now behold, I will show unto you that they did not establish a king over the land, but in this same year, yea, the thirtieth year, they did destroy upon the judgment seat, yea, did murder the chief judge of the land. And the people were divided one against another, and they did separate one from another into tribes, every man according to his family and his kindred and friends, and thus they did destroy the government of the land. And every tribe did appoint a chief or a leader over them, and thus they became tribes and leaders of tribes. Right, we're continuing the story of the uh, Nephite people, right, that they were uh, falling into ways of uh, wickedness once again. In fact, in the previous chapter, you may recall uh, towards the end, there were uh, those who were uh, related to people in high places, and they were uh, uh, passing their own judgments and putting people to, to death if they did things that they didn't like. So it was a, a wicked time. And so now you see it says in the first verses, here it says they were headed, actually at the very end of the last chapter it says that they were looking to establish a king over the land, right? But now it picks up and says they didn't establish a king over the land in this particular year, but they did kill the chief judge. In the previous chapter it had mentioned that uh, Laconius, the chief judge, turned the job over to his son, whose name is also Laconius, so we would assume that that's who was killed here, unfortunately, was the younger Laconius. Right? So you see where it says now that people were divided one against another, and they made their own tribes and uh, groups, and so basically nobody was together. Right? There was no idea of, of one nation. It was just everybody for themselves, right? everybody forming their own little groups and just watching out for themselves. Okay? This is what you have happening. And like in three, it's every tribe appointed a chief or a leader. So everyone had their own, their own group. You know, in a way, when it's, being, it's using the word tribe, you can almost think of, you know, if you remember in these are akin to the Native Americans, right? That how, you know, even in more recent times, even the Native Americans have their own tribes, you know, the, the, the different names of the different Indian tribes, the, the Cherokee and the Sioux and so forth. And so it would almost sound like that, like each one has their own tribe with their own leader, their own rules. And so with, within that group, they have their own order, but as far as the other groups, they have no connection to, to any of those. Okay, so that's what it was like here. Now behold, there was no man among them, save he had much family and many kindreds and friends, Therefore their tribes became exceeding great. Now all this was done, and there were no wars as yet among them, and all this iniquity had come upon the people, because they did yield themselves unto the power of Satan. And the regulations of the government were destroyed, because of the secret combination of the friends and kindreds of those who murdered the prophets. In the verse 4 now it says, there, there was nobody among them save he had much family. In other words, uh, everybody had big families. So that therefore, once you pull together all your family and friends and you know your, your nephews and your grandchildren and your cousins and everybody made for a nice big group. So uh, I guess the tribes were kind of forming perhaps along some lines of, of the bigger families. And so therefore, now you have big tribes because you have big families. Right? So that was all they were interested in now is who they were going to be, be with and not so much what was right for everybody, but just let's, let's make our own group. Let's see, it's a free-for-all. We get to make our own tribe, our own little little kingdom within the, the larger, larger city here. In verse 5, it says, it says, all the iniquity came upon the people because they yielded themselves to the power of Satan. Right? So, so you know, lest it may sound on the surface almost like it's innocent, oh, we're just having like a family get-together, right? Or getting our family together, right? But it was uh, fueled by the power of Satan, right? Because it was built on iniquity, it was built on the idea that if anybody gets in our way, we're going to kill them. It's built on the idea that we don't want to be subject to anybody else, you know, so that everybody else can do whatever they want, we don't care about them, and we just don't bother us, we're going to have our own kingdom and do what we want, don't give us any rules or any laws, and if we want to make laws and say it's okay to kill people, that, that, that we should be allowed to do that, right? So it was that kind of thing, that's why it says it was uh, fueled because they yield themselves to the power of, of Satan. As you can see in 6, it says the regulations of the government of, were, were destroyed because of the secret combination of, of the, these were people who had murdered the, the prophets. And probably, you know, at least one of them had killed the, the chief judge earlier in this chapter. So these were the kind of things they were doing. So it wasn't, like I said, an innocent family get together. It was the idea that we're going to do whatever we want and, and the ways that stop us. Or another comparison could be, you know, when they, when they refer to today's time to... Uh, uh, the family, right? It's uh, that's generally known as like the mob is the, is the family. So you know that's that's and they, that, that's not nice people, right? Just getting other family get together. It's people who they'll they'll kill you as soon as look at you, right? So this is what, what we're talking about here. And they did cause a great contention in the land, insomuch that the more righteous part of the people had nearly all become wicked. Yea, there were but few righteous men among them. 
and thus six years had not passed away since the more part of the people had turned from their righteousness, like the dog to his vomit, or like the sow to her wallowing in the mire. Now this great combination, which had brought so great iniquity upon the people, did gather themselves together, and did place at their head a man whom they did call Jacob, and they did call him their king. Therefore he became a king over this wicked band, and he was one of the chiefest who had given his voice against the prophets who testified of Jesus. Looking at the, the contention caused by the, the, this one group in particular, right, it says that there were but few righteous among them. It had been just within the past six years, this had turned around. Yeah, we commented on the other chapters of how it all happened so quickly, right, that within you know, a couple of years it went from they were all doing well and believing in Jesus and so forth, and suddenly nobody wanted to believe and they were ready to kill the prophets and so forth. So this is what it's referring to as if people who were turned back to the way they were before. And you know, they, in 8, when it gives that uh, some of those phrases, I mean, that's phrases that are sometimes used for people that they go back to, the, to where they came from, like when it says, that, like, like the dog to his vomit, all right, or, or like the sow to her wallowing in, in the mire. So, you know, the idea is if, if you have a, like a pig or a sow that's uh, it's a wallowing in the mire, in other words, you know, in the mud and so forth, if, if you picture pe people that way, you know, wallowing in their own uh, bad things and, some, you know, wallowing in the mud. The idea is that when you come to Christ and you, you change your life, you become a better person. You, you get above that, you rise above that, and you be, become a better person. The idea that you would reach that point and then say, okay, now I'm going to go back to the mud and the mire again, it almost sounds kind of silly. You, know? you lift yourself out of a bad place. And, oh, I think I'll go back to where I was before. But that's what it's comparing to people who met the Lord and had a chance to live a better life and choose to go back to where they were before, that that's what it compared them to, like a dog going back to the vomit or a sow going back to wallowing in the mire. All right, so when people walk away from the Lord, I mean, that's in essence what they're doing, is they're saying, okay, the, the, Jesus saved me from the life I was living. He's, uh, you know, uh, saved me from my sins and for, from, taken all this guilt and so forth off me and, and made me a happier person. But... I think I'll go back to the way it was before, just to, as if it never happened, all right? And I'll just go back and be, be miserable again. And, uh, you know, so it's, again, it seems like a silly thing to choose, but people choose that uh, every day, unfortunately, all right? And that's what these people were, were choosing. Okay, and, and so, uh, so now this particular group that it's focusing on, the, the, they're going to get into the point somebody to be their king. The, the guy named, named Jacob here is going to now be the, the king of this particular group, right? And so it says, you know, he says he was one of the, the main ones who had spoken against the, the prophets, especially the ones who testified of Jesus, right? that this was what he was uh, about, that he was opposed to the idea that, that, that Jesus had come, even though even though all the signs had appeared, even though uh, we have that here, it was the day, the night, and the day of, uh, of daylight, right? and the new star, and all the different things that had happened to show that Jesus was born, but yet now 30 years had passed, so it was enough to, to people's memories, I guess, had faded, and people think something that big would be kind of seared in your memory, but uh, you know, this was what they were talking about then, saying, uh, they, how do we know Jesus came? They're saying he came on some distant land in Jerusalem, and we're here in America, so how can we prove that? How can anybody know that for sure? And it came to pass that they were not so strong in number as the tribes of the people who were united together, save it were their leaders that established their laws, everyone according to his tribe. Nevertheless, they were enemies. Notwithstanding, they were not a righteous people, Yet they were united in the hatred of those who had entered into a covenant to destroy the government. Therefore Jacob, seeing that their enemies were more numerous than they, he being the king of the band, therefore he commanded his people that they should take their flight into the northernmost part of the land, and there build up unto themselves a kingdom, until they were joined by dissenters. For he flattered them that there would be many dissenters, and they become sufficiently strong to contend with the tribes of the people, and they did so. And so speedy was their march that it could not be impeded until they had gone forth out of the reach of the people. And thus ended the 30th year, and thus were the affairs of the people of Nephi. You know, again, they're focusing on Jacob's particular group now. Right? So he's one group of, of many. And uh, so within the, the full group of people, I mean, it, I guess they only had so much power because they were just one small segment of, of the whole group. And so you, so you notice what it says in 11, it says that it, everyone was for themselves, but it says that the main thing they had in common, they were united in, in a hatred towards those who were opposed to them. And this, but I, I think that what it was, was they, they didn't like each other, right? So let's say if there was all the ones who wanted to destroy the government, if there were, say, 10 different groups 
Well, none of them liked each other, and so that's what they had in common, right? What, what I have in common with the other nine groups is I don't like any of the other nine groups, and, and, and none of them like me, and, and so that's what they really had in common. And I think so, and each of them shared that, that they, they told them, I only like myself, I don't like them, I only don't like myself, right? And so that's, that's what they had in common. Okay, so, so now it says in 12, it says J Jacob, seeing that, you know, the enemies were more numerous, he says, well, uh, you know, there's no sense us trying to fight anybody or take anybody over because we'll, we'll lose. Because especially if, if we're not with anybody, so we're not united with anybody, so we're going to lose. If we try to fight anybody, they're all going to gang up on us and we're going to lose this war. So we need to go build up our, our group. So that's why I said let's go to the northernmost part of the, the land it says, and, and wait until people come and, and join in with us. That's the part where it said they flatter themselves or he flattered them, then there would be many dissenters. In other words, we'll wait for people to join us, and they'll say, that's, that's the cool group. You know, that's the cool group. Yeah, we want to be part of that group. So, uh, yeah, the, you know, they're off in the, the northernmost part of the land. You know, that, that's, that's the cool place to be. So we'll just wait till they all come and join in with us, and then we'll have a big group, and then we can take over. So that, that was the, the plan, was to be the cool group and let, let people come, come to them. So that's why it says in 13, it says, so they speedily made their march there, and, uh, and they were out of the reach of the rest of the people, and that's how the, how the 30th year ends, right, with them setting up camp in the northernmost part of the land, waiting for the others to come and join in with them. And it came to pass in the 31st year that they were divided into tribes, every man according to his family, kindred, and friends. Nevertheless, they had come to an agreement that they would not go to war one with another, but they were not united as to their laws and their manner of government, for they were established according to the minds of those who were their chiefs and their leaders. But they did establish very strict laws that one tribe should not trespass against another, insomuch that in some degree they had peace in the land. Nevertheless, their hearts were turned from the Lord their God, and they did stone the prophets and did cast them out from among them. And it came to pass that Nephi, having been visited by angels and also the voice of the Lord, therefore having seen angels and being eyewitness and having had power given unto him that he might know concerning the ministry of Christ, and also being eyewitness to their quick return from righteousness unto their wickedness and abominations, therefore being grieved for the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds, went forth among them in that same year and began to testify boldly repentance and remission of sins through faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. To me, I found it interesting in, in verse 14 when it says that in, in a way, they had peace in the land, and even though they, they were, uh, they all were maybe murderous and hard and, and wanted to make their own rules, but the, the one hard rule they all agreed on is, you, you don't bother me, and I won't bother you, all right? You, you stay in your area, I'll stay in my area, so it's, as long as you don't come over here, I, I, I won't bother you either. So therefore, nobody was fighting with each other, because they were just setting up their own little groups, and so it says, in, in that regard, there was peace in the land, even though it's in... Uh, and, an iniquitous type of, of peace, right? Because nobody is uh, following any kind of righteous laws, but it says they did have that one rule that they made agreed on that none of them was going to bother anybody else. And so, you know, again, I would compare that to some of the examples we've already used tonight. You know, I'm, I'm sure like the different Indian tribes, you know, had to have their own rules, but they, they were going to fight against each other. And the, the, the families of the mob is it, very much that way. I, you know, as long as you don't come on my turf, I won't come on yours. And so, therefore, we won't fight each other. Let's just fight against the, against the police or against whatever, and, the, and we'll, we can all get rich, and let's not bother each other, though. And so that's what, they were, what their agreement was, but we're not going to bother each other. Okay, so that's what, uh, what 14 was. That's the only way they were united. And now, let me say before I go on, it says that this was in the 31st year or so in the land of Jerusalem, that uh, Jesus is now uh, doing his ministry. He's now teaching the, the people, uh, you know, perhaps you know, healing people, uh, teaching them little things that they would need to know, perhaps like the Sermon on the Mount, right? So this, this was all things going on because he, he was doing that from, he, he started the, the year 30 and it was to the year, through the year 33, so this is year 31, so that this, that's what's going on there, is that the ministry of Jesus is, is going on. So the part of the story recorded by the four Gospels is happening at the same time as, as this is happening in the, in the Americas. Okay, so when, now... Nephi, we remember who Nephi is, he's the, you know, the leader of whatever's left of, of the church at this point. And so now it says that, that he's, uh, he says he's being visited by angels, as you can see. So he's, you know, he's still serving as the voice of the Lord here, and so he's still uh, willing to preach the gospel and really put himself at risk because these other groups are going to kill the prophets. They're happy to kill the prophets. In fact, it said at the end of verse 14, they stone the prophets 
and cast him out from among them. But yet it says that he was willing to, uh, to do this because he was an, an eyewitness to the, the, the sign being given. He, he was the one right there in the front line when the, when the, the day, the night, and the day of daylight came, when they, they were threatened they were going to be killed if the sign didn't come, you know, come that, at that particular time. So he's seen all that, so he's you know, willing to stake his, his life on that because he, he, he knows Christ came into the, into the world. If you remember that uh, it, it, you know, when they were threatened with being put to death, it says that Nephi was praying and then the voice of the Lord came to him instead of coming into the world tomorrow and tonight the sign's going to be given. So it, their lives were spared and they, he, he knew that Christ came. So that's why he, he wasn't afraid at this point of, of being wrong. So he knew that he could preach the, the, the word of the Lord, and which, which he did so. So it says that he was you know, grieved by the hardness of everybody's hearts. So he says he began to testify boldly repentance and remission of sin through faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And you know, saying boldly because he was putting his life at risk, but yet he was willing to do that. He knew that he had to speak up for Christ because he knew that Christ was in the world. Okay, it wasn't maybe or, or I, I could be wrong. The Lord told himself he was coming into the world, and then the sign came just a few hours later. So he knew it for a fact. And he did minister many things unto them, and all of them cannot be written, and a part of them would not suffice, therefore they are not written in this book. And Nephi did minister with power and with great authority. And it came to pass that they were angry with him, even because he had greater power than they, for it were not possible that they could disbelieve his words, for so great was his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, that angels did minister unto him daily. And in the name of Jesus did he cast out devils and unclean spirits, and even his brother did he raise from the dead, after he had been stoned and suffered death by the people. And the people saw it, and did witness of it, and were angry with him because of his power. And he did also do many more miracles in the sight of the people in the name of Jesus. Saying some of the things that Nephi was doing as a representative of the Lord. Right? And so, first of all, makes the comment in 17 that there were so, so many things that he did that it wouldn't even make sense to try to list them all here. Right? So, the opinion of the writers is a part of them would not suffice, therefore I'm not going to bother trying to write them in this book. Right? And the, the, the writer, of course, being, uh, being Mormon when he was putting together this particular story from all the records that were kept, so I, I assume that there was a, a, a listing on, on the bigger record of the things that uh, Nephi had done, but uh, yeah, I guess he didn't feel that he wanted to try to shortchange it by saying by highlighting one thing and leaving out ten others. So he just said just suffice it to say that, that he did many great things. Now you, you get a little flavor of it from the verses that follow. And uh, now the, it says that the, the the people were angry with him. Now how dare he be more powerful than us? Right? Instead of understanding that they're they're dealing with a servant of God, a representative of God, right, instead they're angry. It says he, he he has more power than us. <laughs> How dare he have more power than us? We're, we're going to kill him, right? Because we, we don't like that he's got more power than, than we do. And so that's, that's what it says. So they, so they couldn't even disbelieve his words. Says, For so great was his faith in the Lord that angels ministered unto him daily. So in, instead of um, saying, well, gee, if, if I was righteous, maybe the angels would uh, deal with me. Instead, they're angry that the angels are dealing with him, right? It says the angels ministered unto him daily. So in the, in the, it says in 19, some of the things that he did, it says in the name of Jesus, he cast out devils and unclean spirits. It says even his brother, he raised from the dead, right? So, so I guess they had uh, uh, taken the, his brother and killed him. It's, they stoned him to death, and now Nephi came and, and brought him back from the dead, right? So, uh, so yeah, you can see that they're not happy with him. They're angry because we, we can't even kill his brother, right? Because he brings him back to, to life, right? So uh, in, in 20, it says the people saw that and, and witnessed of that. And they were angry because of his power, it says, and he did more miracles in front of the people in the name of Jesus, which, so again, instead of convincing them, it said it, said it made them angry, because that's how, how hard their hearts were at this point, right? That they, I, I want to be in charge, I want to get what I want, I want to be the most powerful, and how, how dare you have more power than me, you know, from, given to you by God, I, I want that for me. So, yeah, they, they were not happy with him, even though all these obvious miracles happening right in front of them in the name of Jesus, but it wasn't... Uh, enough to convince them, only made them more angry. And it came to pass that the thirty and first year did pass away, and there were but few who were converted unto the Lord. But as many as were converted did truly signify unto the people that they had been visited by the power and spirit of God, which was in Jesus Christ, in whom they believed. And as many as had devils cast out from them, and were healed of their sickness and their infirmities, did truly manifest unto the people that they had been wrought upon by the spirit of God, and had been healed, 
and they did show forth signs also, and did do some miracles among the people. Thus passed away the thirty and second year also. And Nephi did cry unto the people in the commencement of the thirty and third year, and he did preach unto them repentance and remission of sins. As the thirty-first year is, is ending, right, it says that there were, uh, there were some who were converted, but it says there were just a few. And, and as we were just saying, it seems hard to believe that when you have such an obvious manifestation of uh, God's power happening in front of you, you would think that a lot of people would be convinced and converted, but it was not the case, as a few were converted. But... But, and, then, and this is, I think, a good point, it says those who were converted were really converted, right? It says, as it says here, that they did truly signify that they had been visited by the power and spirit of God, which was in Jesus Christ, in whom they believed. So they were really converted. It wasn't just that some people said, oh, yeah, the, I, I like what he's doing, so I think I'll, I'll just join with him, right? But rather they were really converted, and so the, they became, if you will, solid members of, of the church at that point, because now they were really converted unto Christ, and they, they really believe. So, yes, it was a small number, but the ones that they got were, I'll say, quality uh, members as opposed to just getting numbers. Uh, in 22, it's uh, talking about, it says, as many as had devils cast out and were healed and so forth, right? These were people who were convinced then of what the, the power of God could do, right? And, and so, it says they, what does it say? It says that they did they show four signs also and, and to do some miracles among the people so that they were now part of the team. So they were able to represent the, the Lord and they even have miracles in their own life. So that's, that's what's happening is year 32 it, is ending and year 33 is beginning. It says that you know, Nephi continues to preach repentance to the people, pointing to all these different miracles and so forth that are happening and saying, you know, here's witness and power and evidence of that what I'm saying is true. I'm preaching the Lord Jesus Christ in the name of Christ. People are being healed. Devils are being cast out. The, the dead is raised. And so he's able to point to all these things as uh, evidence that what he's saying is true. Now I would have you to remember also that there were none who were brought unto repentance who were not baptized with water. Therefore there were ordained of Nephi men unto this ministry that all such as should come unto them should be baptized with water. And this is a witness and a testimony before God and unto the people that they had repented and received the remission of their sins. And there were many in the commencement of this year that were baptized unto repentance and thus the more part of the year did pass away. And it's just pointing out from a standpoint of the, you know, of the, the beliefs that, that we've always put out, that those who repented, it wasn't just a matter of saying, you know, raise your hand and say, I repent, and, and that's the end, but rather that they were baptized. It says that they went into the water and were baptized. That's why it says, I would have you remember, there were none who were brought to repentance who were not baptized with water. And every single person who repented of their sins was baptized with water. So that's why it says, then, therefore, Nephi had an ordained minister so they could baptize everybody. Because for a while, if you remember back at the beginning of 3 Nephi, it says that Nephi was doing all the baptisms. Right? Well, like when Samuel the Lamanite was talking to the people that those who believed, he, he sent them off to find that Nephi, actually was the senior Nephi then, but they went to find him to be baptized because he was the only one doing the baptizing. Well, now there's enough that's going to be baptized and Nephi is ordaining others to do the baptisms just as we in the, in the church have you know, people or ordained in all different parts of the country able to do, do baptisms, right? So, that, so they, they did that for a, as it says in the second half of 23, the purpose of the baptism was to be a witness and a testimony before God that they repented and received the remission of their sins, right? And that's what baptism is for. It's a, an, an outward sign of what's happened inside. I mean, you know, yes, you repent of your sins uh, within, and yes, you know, God can forgive you of your sins, but then by being baptized, that's, you're making an outward appearance. This is what's happened. This is what I've done. This is the promise that I'm making. And I, I don't care that everybody sees it. But I want everybody to see it and know that this is the promise I'm making today. That I'm being forgiven of my sins and promising that I'm going to serve God. Right? You, you all did that when you were baptized. That's, that was, that's really the, the purpose. You follow God's command, but you then make that promise openly that uh, you're going to serve God and, and you're forgiven of your sins that, that day. So it says they, they all did that. And so this one says there were many in the commencement of this year that were baptized unto repentance, and that's how this particular year is rolling on. And this is year 33, right? So as we've been counting the, the years, so it's like you see now this is year 33. This is the last year for Jesus in the, his ministry in Jerusalem. So year 33 is going to end with the, with the crucifixion then. So, you know, so now he's you know, doing the, the, the things that were in the latter part of his ministry. So you know, speaking about the, the things that would come in the future and so forth, this is what he was doing at that particular time of the latter part of the, of the four Gospels.